Thanks everybody for joining us today. It's such a treat to be able to bring people together from so many corners of the world for this conversation that, that we're gonna be having. We're just thrilled to, to dive in. You know, in addition to uh, the land that the University of Wisconsin at Madison is on, um, you know, also wanna recognize there are a couple of other big landscapes that play a part in our conversation today. Several of our guests are in the desert Southwest and on that Southern edge of the Colorado Plateau. And then also the Yellowstone region, home to our guest, Doug Peacock and the, the Grizzlies with whom he's made his life's work. And we'll be diving into that more in a moment. I also just wanna give a quick thank you to the people who are working so hard behind the scenes to make today's conversation happen. Uh, Rachel Gurney, Associate Director of the Center for Culture, History and Environment and Emily Reynolds, who's the Assistant Director for Community Engagement and Alumni Relations at the Nelson Institute are running all of our tech today and have worked so hard to, to bring everybody together. So thank you. So today we're just blessed to have the opportunity to talk with a really impressive group of panelists and guests who have so generously given their time to talk about the past, present, and future currents of environmental activism in the United States. We intend for this conversation to range pretty widely, uh, but the fact that we have the opportunity to gather here today and talk is due to author and director M.L. Lincoln's just years of work probing the work and, and legacies of writer and activist Ed Abbey. So Ed Abbey was a key figure in the 20th century radical environmental movement in North America. He called the desert Southwest his home for most of his adult life. And Abby worked a stint as a National Park Service Ranger in Arches National Park in Utah in the 1950s. Many of the essays in his famous book, Desert Solitaire, were inspired by his work there. Abby was a fierce advocate for wild places and he railed against the industrial development of public lands, uranium mining in Utah, coal mining on the Navajo Reservation, and of course the drowning of Glen Canyon with the construction of Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell in Southern Utah. The loss of Glen Canyon galvanized an entire generation of activists and that legacy is still alive today. Abby's novel, The Monkey Wrench Gang is another classic in the canon of environmental activism. It chronicles the, chronicles the exploits of a group of friends who are fed up with industrial capitalism's relentless encroachment on wild places. So they take matters into their own hands and sabotage construction equipment, cut down billboards and plot to blow up the Glen Canyon Dam. Filmmaker, M.L. Lincoln, who has joined us today, she's produced two striking works on Abby's legacy and the environmental movements he helped to inspire. The 2014 film, Wrenched, combined archival footage, reenactments and interviews with dozens of thinkers and activists to look at the rise of direct action environmentalism you can stream that movie online. ML Lincoln and Diane Sword Rappaport have now published a selection of the interviews featured in the film. And that book's entitled Wrenched from the Land, Activists Inspired by Edward Abbey. It's published by the U University of New Mexico Press. And you can find that at your local bookstore. In the chat, we've got a, a link to A Room of One's Own, one of our favorite local bookstores here in Madison where you can find that book. So Lincoln describes the people featured in, in the book as the heroes that carried the legacy of Edwards Abbey's ideas into the 21st century. Writer and activist Bill McKibben, who helped to found 350.org, the largest group dedicated to fighting climate change, he wrote the foreword for the book. And in that foreword, he says, each one of these interviews on its own is powerful, but together they paint a group portrait of a time, a place, and a way of looking at the world that offers some nostalgic solace, but also some astute counsel for moving ahead into our current mess. And that's really our hope in hosting this discussion today is to steep in that astute counsel for moving through this mess that we find ourselves in. We of course face some of the same challenges that environmental activists have struggled against for decades an economy and political system fueled by a sense of entitlement to exploit the natural world, and institutions that often fail to carry out their legal responsibility to protect people and places from environmental harm. But our current moment also has its own character. The climate crisis is an existential threat like none other. 
It's a threat that we all face together, but that is experienced so differently depending on one's class, race, and geography. And our institutions also seem particularly fragile right now. And it puts activists in an interesting spot. Rather than challenging those institutions or often working around them, progressive activists today more often find themselves in the position of defending and bolstering the institutions that at least have the potential to protect our wild places. And that's a really delicate dance. And it's a topic that I think we're all excited to dive into with our, our panelists and guests. So let me give you all a sense of, of how our conversation will, will unfold today. In just a moment, I'll introduce uh, our guests, tell you a little bit about their background. We'll then give our graduate student panelists a chance to introduce themselves. We're really fortunate to have three graduate students from the Center for Culture, History, and Environment uh, here today to help drive this conversation. I'll then kick off, kick off the conversation with uh, uh, some questions for ML Lincoln about the production of these two really impressive works, and then we'll move to uh, some specific questions for our different guests. We're hoping to also be able to set aside some time if we get this right uh, at the, the end of, uh, of the event today to be able to take in questions from the audience too. So thanks again for tuning in. Um, hope you all can sit back and enjoy and, and, and really learn something exciting. So let me share a little bit about our guests today. Um, we are of course joined by ML Lincoln. Uh, she's a storyteller, activist, author, award-winning photographer and filmmaker. She produced and directed two esteemed documentaries, uh, Wrench, which I was just talking about a minute ago, and then also Drowning River. And along with Diane Sword Rappaport, she's the editor of this collection of interviews that brings us together today, Wrenched from the Land, Activists Inspired by Ed Abbey. Uh, in the introduction to that book, ML noted that uh, a few years ago, she was fuming over the reckless and regressive politics of the new presidential administration, which she says placed the environment and native lands under siege. She saw all the transcripts from the film and really recognized that they represent what she called a, a potent counter to anti-conservation politicians and climate deniers, uh, and therefore brought this book into the world. We're really excited to have ML with us. We're also uh, joined today by Jack Leffler. Jack's an oral historian, an environmentalist, writer, a radio producer, and a sound collage artist. Uh, he's the author and editor of a lot of books, including Thinking Like a Watershed, Voices from the West, and also Adventures with Ed, uh, a portrait of Ed Abbey, uh, which I can't recommend highly enough if you're curious to dive further into to Abbey's legacy in life. Jack traveled all around the American West and Mexico recording folk and indigenous music and, and making stereo recordings of, of natural habitats. And if you've had the pleasure of seeing the film Wrenched, uh, Jack is the narrator for that film. Then we're also joined by Terry Tempest Williams. And Terry's distinguished for her magical and lyrical writing on the ethical, political, and spiritual relationships between wilderness and humans. She's a crucial voice for the necessity of combining ecological consciousness and ethical social change. Williams has received a lot of awards for her leadership in the American conservation environment. Uh, she's the author of 15 books and her essays have been published in outlets like the New York Times, The New Yorker, and Orion. Uh, for just a quick taste of Terry's writing and personality, uh, I'd really recommend a, a recent episode of the podcast of The Daily from the New York Times, um, which features a conversation with Terry and a, a short piece of writing around the idea of an obituary to the land, um, which all circles around the wildfires this past summer. And finally, we're joined by Doug Peacock. Author and naturalist Doug Peacock, he's published widely on wilderness issues ranging from grizzly bears to buffalo, from the Sonoran Desert to the fjords of British Columbia, from the tigers of Siberia to the blue sheep of Nepal. Among his many books is the well-renowned Grizzly Years in Search of the American Wilderness. Uh, Doug was a friend of Ed Abbey's, and many of you will know he is the model for the character George Hoodoo in the novel, The, the Monkey Wrench Gang. Doug spent a lot of years living close to Yellowstone's grizzlies, uh, and his book, The Grizzly Years, is a really gripping story about his return from Vietnam, 
the role of wild places in his own healing and the grizzlies that he's that he's lived with. You know, and selfishly in, in my own work in wilderness therapy and adventure guiding, I've just read and reread that book during my own backcountry trips. And uh, I just want to say, Doug, that that book has been one of the touchstones for my experience of wild places as well. So why don't we take a moment here and I want to give our grad student panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, and then we'll turn to ML for some questions. And Kasha, why don't you get us started? Okay, um, so my name is Kasha Shaw and I'm a PhD candidate in the composition and rhetoric program in the English department at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Hello, uh, my name is John Coban. I'm also in the composition and rhetoric program um, in the Depart Department of English at UW-Madison. And I'm also a CHA graduate associate. Hi, uh, I'm David Greenwood Sanchez. I'm a PhD candidate in political science and I study the politics of genetically modified crops in Mexico and in Peru. Thank you all. Well, let's get right to it. Um, ML, you know, your work is what brings us all together today. So first, thank you. Thanks for that and the opportunity to have this conversation today. But for folks in the audience who haven't had the chance to see Wrenched or to read this really fabulous collection of interviews in Wrenched from the Land, um, can you introduce us to this book and talk us through some about your motivations to pursue the work? I unmuted. There we go. Hi, everybody. Well, I first want to thank um, Bryce, Emily, and Catherine White at the University of New Mexico Press to, to help me put this book together. They were fantastic to work with. And uh, actually, Jack Loeffler was the one that, that spurred me on with the University of New Mexico Press because they have published a lot of Jack's books. And I wanna thank the grad students. I, I, I'm really impressed with their work and their questions and the center for putting this on. I think it's, it's really been an incredible experience. And then of course, I wanna thank Jack, Terry and Doug. They've always been supportive of me and I feel very touched by that. So thank you, you three. Um, as Charlie said, I've been a, a filmmaker, storyteller, photographer, and activist since the Vietnam War. And I began my film Wrenched in 2007 and finished it in 2014. Just wanna read you a little thing about Wrenched. Wrenched is a provocative blend of unique archival footage and compelling interviews with some of Abby's feisty monkey wrenching friends. This film is really an environmental history, exposing the complex, pivotal, and uncompromising era that had both the challenges, frustrations, and accomplishments of the conservation movement. It started really um, with John Dupuy and Ed Abbey taking down billboards in uh, Taos as they were encroaching on Taos, and then all the way to Tim De Christopher, who was protesting illegal oil and gas leases uh, around Moab in Southeast Utah. So at that point, I, my crew and myself really went around the country and we interviewed 40 people. And the I started in 2007, as I said, and I interviewed a uh, legendary river runner, my first interview, Ken Slight, who was also the inspiration for seldom seen Smith in the Monkey Wrench Gang. I think Ken and Ryan are listening now. Uh, and 22 people were selected from those 40 interviews to be in the film. And with documentary, you just go from one lead to another lead to another lead. It's an amazing uh, many years process and being able to be in people's homes and, and the archival footage was uh, something I really concentrated on and also being able to see people's private photographic collections um, of, of times past, it was really incredible. So as uh, Charlie said in 2017, I, had, I was looking at the current administration and I was really 
fuming over uh, where the environment was being placed. It was being placed under siege. And uh, I, I looked at these 25 huge notebooks that I had of over 2,066 pages of uh, transcripts. And I said to myself, something, something else could be done here. And I remember Kieran Suckling, he's the direct co-founder of uh, the Center for Biological Diversity down in Tucson, an amazing organization. And he said to me, activism is not waiting for your opponent to retire. And I went, wow, I got goosebumps. And I went, this is time, this is the time to do this book. So uh, first of all, I wanted to show you the cover, which is done by artist, there we go, John Dupuy, Taos artist. And I was so lucky to go into his house, have a couple of meals and look at all his artwork. And I, I, this one really struck me and it's called The Needles, which is part of Canyonlands in Southeast Utah. And I went to a lot of bookstores and looked at covers and I thought, boy, this is it. This is really great. So um, I'd like to read a little bit from Wrench from the Land, features 16 interviews with some of the most iconic echo warriors to put themselves on the line for their beliefs. They lit the flame of environmental activism and changed the course of contemporary conservation history. And to me, what the book represents, and Terry Tempest Williams talks about this, is community. And community is always something that I have uh, found very important to me and the call to action. And uh, so in this book, even though every, some people are going towards their convictions in a different way, they're, they're creating their actions, their convictions in a different way, but they're all a community going towards one goal. And this is what Terry Tempest Williams said, quoting you, Terry. This is the enduring legacy of Ed Abbey. He created a community, a different kind of community, a community that honored a sovereignty of spirit, taking the word radical and bringing it into the notion of conservation, excuse me, bringing it into the notion of conservative, to conserve, to protect, to love. And I really found that that's, that's, that's what my book entails. It's this group and community of people. So we are not alone. And that's important to know. We are not out there alone. Well, Mel, let's, let's dive into that community just a little bit more. You know, we're, it's such a treat. We're going to have three contributors to the book speaking with us uh, this afternoon. But there are another 13 people that are featured in your book, 24 others whom you interviewed for the film um, who don't have a chance to be here with us today. I'm curious about just your process of how did you choose those interviews to, to include in the book? And you know, were there any surprises that, that came up in the, you know, in the course of those conversations or going back through those transcripts again? Well, when I did the film, as I said, it snowballed and it wasn't really a hard choice of who to interview just because it was just this friends upon friends upon friends that I went and interviewed. The book that I co-edited with my dear friend, Diane Rappaport, uh, we spent a long time coming up with the 16 people who would be in the book. I just wanna give um, a moment to give praise to my dear friend, co-editor Diane, who passed away this year and she didn't get to see the, the, the actual book in her hand, but um, I told her that I, I put her in the dedication as well as I did my sister. And Diane was a fabulous writer and please look up some of her books. Um, so some of the uh, issues that were in the film I didn't see a place in the book at this time. And, you know, these are issues that can be uh, explored later on, like the animal liberation right, rights and um, ELF and um, Prescott Four. Those were some pretty big issues that I covered in the film, part of them, 
that I felt didn't belong in the book. And for instance, I went and interviewed in San Francisco, a legendary civil rights lawyer, Dennis Cunningham. And um, he was the one who represented uh, Fred Hampton's family. He was the Black Panther who was murdered by the Chicago police in 1969. He also um, represented Judy Berry uh, when she was falsely charged by the FBI for being a terrorist. So that's a whole nother story. And that didn't make it into um, the book. And you did read Bill McKibben's foreword. And uh, I was very fortunate to have Bill write the foreword. And that, that to me described pretty, pretty exactly why I chose these people. And I think that's, that kind of describes that in a short order. But surprises, um, well, I, I would say the, now Doug will find this kind of funny, but um, I would say there are two surprises. One surprise is when I went to go interview Doug, I, um, my first interview with him, other times it was at the hot springs and blah, 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 but he was a larger than life figure in my mind. And so I was pretty nervous. <laughs> And I had read, you know, all his books and seen uh, the films that he had made and other interviews. And I got to the interview and, you know, I had all my questions and, and we're kind of in the beginning of it. And I'd asked him this question about, uh, it was way back when a book that he had written and it was some, some obscure idea that I had that, that maybe he could answer, but he turned to me and he goes, Emel, I don't remember that. That was a long time ago. So you gotta go on. And I thought, oh no. And so I that was a surprise. But I, I certainly learned from that as an interviewer that you just uh, take a deep breath, right, Doug? And you go on. But that was a surprise, you know, that he stopped me and he goes, Hey, you know, you gotta go on here. So that that was good. Thank you, Doug. And the other surprise major surprise to me was um, that I was invited into these 40 people's households. I had sent the film um, Drowning River, which was about Katie Lee, Western balladeer activist to everybody. So that was, that was like my calling card. And, but still I was, these are very private people and they had in the past, been really in the forefront and had um, a lot going on in their lives, either good or bad. And, you know, who am I? Who the hell was I to, you know, come interview them? But that was a big surprise to me that I was uh, accepted and befriended many people who were in the film and in the book. And I, I just feel very fortunate that I was able to do that. And that just really thrilled me beyond belief. So. Thank you. John, let me pass the microphone over to you. Um, and I think you have our first questions for our guest, Jack Leffler. Yes. Uh, so Jack, um, can you hear me, Jack? All right. Uh, so throughout your interview with ML and Wrench from the Land, you describe one of the political ideologies um, guiding your activism as a kind of anarchism. Uh, so two questions. First, how do you understand anarchism? And then in terms of the modern environmental movement, what role do you see anarchism playing now and continuing to play in the future? Well, I'll address the first part of that as best I can. First of all, anarchism itself is a really complex subject. I think the first person who was regarded as an anarchist was, uh, gee whiz. <laughs> I've got it right here because I've read part of his work, but uh, Godwin, uh, William Godwin, who happened to be, this cracks me up, the mother, the father of Mary Godwin Shelley, who was the author of Frankenstein. And I've wondered if actually in her mind, Frankenstein was the first anarchist. <laughs> anyway. There's a whole series of anarchists. A lot of it took place, much of it, uh, throughout the 19th century 
took place in Europe, which really was kind of dismal politically. Uh, one of the things that prevailed even in many countries to then was the whole notion of the divine right of kings, which to me in America has sort of transmogrified into the corporate right of first refusal, if that makes any sense. In other words, we inherited in the United States a whole system of European attitudes, some of which included the anarchist perspective, but it included so many different perspectives. In other words, the whole system of institutions that prevailed in Europe in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries found a place over here. And so to me, of all of those European anarchists, the one who really spoke to me most clearly was Peter Kropotkin, who himself, Charles, was a, a geographer, a great geographer and geologist and natural uh, historian who armed with Darwin's writing, went into Manchuria and Siberia to map mountains, but in the meantime, really started studying the ecology of each of these different places. And he wrote many books. I still have three. I just shipped off 10 books from my anarchist library to a friend of mine who has a lending library on anarchist thought over in uh, the foothills of Sierra Nevada. But the ones that I've kept, one is Mutual Aid, which I regard as Kropotkin's magnum opus, where on page 300, and I'm paraphrasing like mad, but basically says, evolution of culture and species, but human culture and species owes far more to mutual cooperation than mutual antagonism. And to me, I've taken that as a huge cue. And uh, I really appreciate Kropotkin's thinking. I've had this tacked up on the wall of my studio, which is his definition, I won't read it, his definition of an anarchist society, but it's been on the wall of my studio for about half a century now. And uh, I really take it to great heart. Now, back in 1973, uh, great buddy, Ed Abbey, gave me this book, Anarchism by George Woodcock, which to me really is a great history up until it was published in 1962 of anarchist thought, and I have read the book, but what I really feel is that so much of it deals with the whole array of European perspectives that we've gotten used to over here. Now we've changed a lot of it. In other words, we claimed our own system in the United States away from uh, European rule, but what we really came up with is an alternative which to me is one of the most evil concepts ever emerged from the human consciousness. And that's manifest destiny that happened in the 19th century when it was decided by the powers that be that we had the right to take over the entire part of the continent, which includes the current 48 coterminous states. And that resulted in the extermination of numerous Native American cultures who had lived here for many thousands of years, somewhere between 12, 15, even more thousand years. In other words, they got here well before the end of the last ice age, which ended about 11,000, 12,000 years ago. And so their whole system of attitudes had grown out of the habitat to which they had become engaged where they lived. And I felt that that was one of the great evils. And so much of my environmentalism has had to do with, well, the anarchist strain within it has been to really resist an entire system of attitudes and law. A lot of human legislation in this country is in absolute violation 
of the laws and principles of nature. And from my perspective, if you're faced with a choice like that, who do you go with? Well, there's no choice as far as I'm concerned. You put your emphasis on really helping to sustain the principle of nature rather than the principles of a faulty, erroneous culture that still presides. And one of the big things, and I'll end here on this subject, but the upshot is, is that I feel that our greatest problem in this country today is a system of cultural attitudes, which is totally out of sync with the prevailing governing body. And to that extent, I feel that we have to really decentralize or at least partially decentralize. I've, I, I conducted as uh, was said earlier on, I've done a lot of oral history. And one of the people that I interviewed about 10, 12 years ago before she died was Eleanor Ulstrom, who had written a book called Governing the Commons, which was sort of a, an answer to Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. But she forwarded a concept that her husband, Vincent, had come up with, which is polycentric governance. And that begins with the grassroots. And it doesn't do away with federal governance or state governance or even county governance. But it includes all of these different levels in its purview. But it starts with the grassroots. She got the 2009 Nobel for that book and it's really worth having read. But at any rate, I feel that the spirit of anarchism itself is so complex that I don't regard myself as an anarchist. I used to, well, maybe even up to two or three years ago. But now I'm just this guy from Parkersburg, West Virginia, who's still trying his best. Thanks, Jack. You know, one of the things I've heard you talk about in some other interviews and in your work as a, an oral historian is, you know, this practice of learning to listen and learning to listen to the habitat around you and the non-human creatures around you as well as, as, other, as, well as other people. Um, and I think that's a, a theme that's really come up, Doug, in, in your work as well. And so, you know, David, why don't we shift over to you and um, curious about your questions for Doug. I, um, well, I'm glad to be here. Um, Doug, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, so one of the really the, the perennial questions and challenges for environmental activism is this question, kind of like what we've been discussing already, of, of how radical it should be. Um, and activists tend to always confront some version of, of this question, and it's do we work within a more institutional framework, so within nonprofits, NGOs, legal advocacy, or do we try to find out some, to, to seek out more unconventional forms of activism, things that are outside of the system and some things that might even challenge the system itself. So I'm wondering you as someone who's worked uh, as an environmental activist in so many different settings, how do you approach this dilemma? How do you think of this question? Um, and how have you approached this within, within your career? Well, I'm a, I'm pretty much an outsider. You know, I don't join groups. I don't go to meetings, and uh, when I do go to meetings, I'm usually a speaker. And one thing I tell everybody, especially young people, is you know where do we start? And I tell them every time, look in your backyard and start there. And you know, my backyards have been all over the place. And uh, I do look out and, and uh, you know, and see what I think needs to be done and then figure a way to do it. And, you know, I founded four organizations. I founded Round River Conservation Studies. Oh, I was board chair for 25 years. So that was a long time ago. Um, and they work with indigenous people on the blank spots that you can find on maps of the earth. And they discovered that, uh, you know, it may be blank, but indigenous people live there. 
And by working with indigenous people, they've been able to have mutually uh, concurrent goals of protecting wild habitat, and whether it's indigenous territories or, you know, or um, uh, the more, the more common wilderness issue, it's the same because what, what, what you know, what uh, we all wanted together was a, a place with no logging and, and uh, no mining and no commercial exploitation. And, uh, and no thanks to me because I've just sort of stood by the sidelines. Round River has now saved about 36 million acres. And that means uh, conserving it or preserving it with their indigenous partners. You know, there's the, that, that, that's, that's a lot. That, you got to go back to Jimmy Carter to find, you know, that many uh, acres under protection on, on three different continents. And they're working on five right now. Um, and then, you know, back about the time Ed dies, died, there was a picture and, and uh, there was of 17 mountain lion heads against the, against the tree. Doug, let me interrupt you for one second. Your audio is a little bit choppy. And so I'm going to have Rachel just turn off your video while you're speaking and see if that can see sure. out your audio. OK. Um, so those mountain lion skulls haunted me. They came from a, a particular ranch on a national forest uh, cattle lease. And uh, for Ed Abbey's wake, I went out with a couple friends and we poached a cow out there for sheep herder stew. That's where that came from. But more, more than that, I, I, I co-founded in Yvonne Chenard's front yard. Um, I think we called it Wildlife Damage Review. And it was run by a group of mostly five really dedicated, talented women in Tucson. And the idea was to get rid of those sons of bitches, the so-called wildlife uh, animal control people of the Department of Agriculture. You know, they're the ones that go out and, you know, and, and drag puppies out of wolf dens and, and lion kittens out of lion dens and kill them. They poison them. They put fucking, excuse me, they put uh, cyanide all over the place. They're still doing so today. And, you know, that's a battle I, I thought we could win and we didn't. And they're still going after it and I'm still going after them. Um, I also had a hand in co-founding Vital Ground. I don't work with them anymore, but they, they acquire key pieces of grizzly habitat. Um, and then a couple of years ago, the Federal Wildlife Service, the Fish, uh, yeah, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, delisted Yellowstone grizzly. And they put out a, you know, they, they put out their rule. And among other things, they said that, you know, cl climate change has no effect upon the grizzly whatsoever. This is the Yellowstone grizzly. So the Yellowstone grizzly whatsoever, uh, nor is it anticipated to have in the future. They wrote that, that's still there. When, you know, uh, we took them to court two years, we kicked their ass but they're still using that phrase. It's still in the rule, you know? And th this has been, uh, um, the, the state game and fish people are really bad on settling conflicts between cattle and grizzlies of which there are not many, but it ends up with a dead bear every time. And to do that because, because of our court case, collective court case, there's a lot of, lot of groups and people in it. Um, you know, we got the grizzly, Yellowstone grizzly back on the endangered species list as a threatened animal. And, you know, the feds are technically in charge of that, but they rubber stamp everywhere. And so um, I had to found a group that's still active today called Save the Yellowstone Grizzly. And I just finished producing a film. It's a 
27 minute film and it we're still messing with it, the titles and the music but it's done and uh and i, I wrote a book this last year i was amazed uh, i uh, wasn't sure i had another book in me and i'm still not but uh, i ground one out in four or five months i surprised myself and you know so all those are tools they're tools and they're as Terry would say, weapons that I use to fight battles. You know, one of the most important things to get accomplished is to change the face of the Federal Wildlife Service. To do that, we need a new director. That means I have to get to uh, get to someone that can talk to the Department of the Interior, whoever that is to be, and make sure they stick an someone that believes in climate change in that position because they do not believe in climate change. They won't list the wolverine. The wolverine's reproduction is 100% dependent upon persistent spring snow. That's not good enough for them. Um, they're now trying some kind of bogus. Uh, they listed the uh, white bark pine, which is bizarre because that's not actionable. You know, what killed the white bark pine was climate change. And they deny that climate change has anything to do with it. And, um, and how are they going to fight that anyway? I mean, climate change will come in every, every issue, every animal I'm interested in, every ecosystem. It is the beast of our time. It's, it's everywhere. It's going to get us. No species much larger than a meadow vole will survive this one at the rate we're going. And it'll be within the lifetime of our collective families. It's, it is right upon us. And, um, you know, I'm gonna go after everything through that prism, whether I'm making a movie or giving a lecture or, uh, you know, or uh, writing another book. That is the beast of our time and, uh, um, along the list of species that are endangered, we're going to add Homo sapien any minute now. Doug, I want to bring Kasha and, and Terry into the conversation here um, because you know, one of the things I hear you talking about in going through these series of organizations that you've helped found and the different tools that you've adopted is, you know, this incredible sense of frustration with the institutions that aren't serving us and yet also trying to adopt you know, what can be the tools and what can be the methods that are effective in moving the needle and actually creating the change you know so that those institutions might might work for us again um, so kasha let me hand it over to to you um, to bring terry into the conversation Thank you. Um, so Terry, in your interview with ML and Wrench from the Lands, you talk about a protest in which you were arrested. Um, and you told the police officer that a pen and paper stuck in your boot were your weapons. And then you told another story about the time you brought your father to come hear Edward Abbey speak. And despite their political differences, your father found common ground with Abbey in their spiritual connection to nature based on Abby's stories. So I was wondering if you could talk more about how you see writing and storytelling as really important weapons or tools of activism. I just want to honor you, John and David and Kasha as graduate students at the University of Wisconsin. Um, that's where I met at Abby and you know, that encounter of being able to talk to him really changed my life. Um, because what I saw with Ed was not just a writer, but a philosopher, a person who truly believed, as he said, that sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. And he put us on notice. And I just, I, I just want to say, I don't think people can realize the impact he had on our generation um, with Desert solitary 1968 which really was almost an anti i would say it was an anti-war novel with um vietnam so your question is a is a great one kasha and i i just also want to first acknowledge ml um what you did 
in bringing this history forward. Because I think in many ways, um, history can create cardboard characters. And, you know, when you look at Ed Abbey, when you look at Leffler, when you look at Doug Peacock, um, Ken Slight, who I know is listening, these are larger than life people, um, Dupuis, you know, who are brilliant and smart and elegant in their thinking and who care and who love. And I think that's really important when you talk about um, what is an activist, because I think sometimes we think that they're just all action, you know, spontaneous, not at all. They're, there's a rigor here. And I think that's the tradition of bravery that we see in our country, um, especially with direct action, whether it's Thoreau, whether it's Martin Luther King, whether it's um, the young activists we see on the street with racial injustice and certainly climate activists like Tim to Christopher. And um, we can go through that, that whole um, line of thinking. But, you know, I was thinking about the Monkey Ranch Gang, and it's Ken Slight who spoke to us, a group of students, and said, you know, find your monkey ranch and use it. And whether that's a pen, whether that's your organizational skills, whether that's running for office, you know, it's your creativity. And I feel like whether we use the word, you know, as um, I did weapons, um, when an officer cinched my body and found a bulge in my pants down by my ankle and lifted up my pant leg and found a pad of paper and a pen. That came out of my mouth, you know, weapons, I replied. And I realized it was in that moment I became a writer, that I was willing to cross the line, that I was willing to commit civil disobedience in a dignified tradition at the Nevada test site where nine women in my family have all had mastectomies and seven are dead. For me, that moment of crossing that line um, at the Nevada test site was the same action of what Doug has been doing his entire life in terms of fighting wars, whether it's war on in Vietnam or the war on wilderness. Um, for me, it was about family. It was about my community and being lied to. You know, I love when Camus says, um, words are more powerful than munitions. And I was just reading, you know, here we are in this middle of a pandemic. And I love Toni Morrison where she says, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilization heal. And then she goes on to say, I know the world is bruised and bleeding. And though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom like art. So I feel like now is the time for artists, the art of activism, the art of science, the art of public policy, the art of loving one another. And you know, I can honestly say my love for Doug has been a driving force in my life. And it was because I know this is a man of character who will not lie to me and who is not afraid that he will not look away. And we met on a trail in Glacier National Park um, some 40 years ago, you know, and I just, when ML talks about that this is about community, this is about family, this is about love, you know, I would, if Doug's saying, find your, you know, look to your backyard. If Jack is saying, think about what anarchy really is, you know, I would say, find your community and build your life around it. Because that has been where my joy is, that has been where my power lies, and that is where my work resides. Terry, one of the things that really struck me about what you were saying there was that, you know, this idea that history can create cardboard characters. And yet in all the people, ML, that you're featuring in your work, you know, we find, as, as Terry just said so well, a sense of rigor and elegance and bravery. And ML, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to chime in here if there was, you know, anything else that 
that you wanted to say about you know the history that in that, that you're telling and developing and sharing these stories about about Abby's legacy. You know, I can imagine many ways that this is sort of working against that grain of cardboard characters, but I wonder if that that idea brings anything up for you. Um, I, I think Abby's legacy could be answered by um, Jack, Doug, or Terry a, a little bit better than me, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, great. Thank is you. that, I mean, ask them because I think they, they were friends of his. I realized that I, you know, that, that I put the book around Ed Abbey and, and the film and his friends and all of that. But I think the legacy is something that they could really speak to better than I could actually, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jack or Doug, would either of you like to chime in here? Um, and if either one of you would like to speak, you just need to unmute yourselves first. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, Jack, I hear you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. And that is that, that pervades our culture so thoroughly today because, uh, you know, the all roads out of here paved with ruined souls. And uh, yeah, this is gonna be the hardest fight of our life as activists, you know, uh, uh, getting out and taking on however necessary. Uh, we've, we've had a, a, a government that's done a tremendous amount of damage. And, you know, to try to rectify every little act and somebody will figure out a way to do that. Um, you're going to go to jail occasionally, so you should, you know, watch your backside. It's better not to go to jail. And uh, Ed Abbey told us a long time ago to go bury a really good deer rifle. And radically and tragically, I see that on the horizon. Um, uh, these crazy uh, right-wing armed groups are a true fearsome, you know, horde. And we're gonna be, be stuck with that kind of mentality for a long time. At the same time, it's gonna get hotter. Um, Ed Abbey would want us to jump right in on all of those things right now. And it, it, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not, what's right is not always legal and vice versa. And uh, uh, I'll end up in the slammer maybe a couple more times. Uh, Jack and I are going to run out of time, but uh, that's a legacy for me, and, and it's a big one because uh, everything he loved, I love. I love you know the, the great canyons, the cactus desert, and of course I like my bears. And when my bears go to sleep, which is right about now. You know, I can't get down to the desert quick enough. And I'm going to have to take a great big gasp and show up there on February 1st, uh, waving safely at Terry's house. I'll, I'll be down in Colorado. And, and to join my community. And uh, that's, that's Ed's legacy, you know. Too. I'm going to say one sentence yeah. for you, Jack, also just that we've seen the legacy with that whole monolith in um, Canyonlands, <laughs> you know, four people under the cover of darkness took down that monolith. And uh, I think the only thing that wasn't in Ed's legacy is they gave their names. Thanks, Terry. Jack, did you have something you wanted to, to say before we go back to, to Kasha and Terry's conversation? Well, first of all, I just, boy, it's so good to see both Terry and Doug, dear friends. I wanted to mention one thing in response to 
Terry having talked about what crossing the Nevada test grounds re resurrected in my own memory is that in 1957, as a young jazz musician drafted into the United States Army, I was in an army band and I played at the very bomb that dumped the tailings on Terry's family's car. And when Terry and I saw that in common, it brought both of us to tears, boy. But as far as Ed is concerned, gee whiz, his legacy is enormous. Um, I remember as you were mentioning that, I remember back in January the 1st, 1983, Ed and I came out of a 10 or 12 day camping trip in the Superstition Mountains. We both knew he had the malaise that would finally carry him away, which it did about six and a half years, seven years later, and six years later. And uh, I whipped out my recorder and we sat in his writing cabin west of Tucson in those days. There were very few houses around his house then. And I recorded Ed for the better part of a, a day. And every now and then I listened back to that recording because I have to say that Ed was probably the most prescient person I ever knew. And boy, listening to Ed talking about his own perspective in his own words off the top of his head is one of the greatest things I have still. And uh, I just finished a radio series the other day and Ed's included in that radio series because his words need to be heard. And I recall asking him what he thought about eco-terrorism. And he said that when it becomes necessary, it's probably already too late. He took great umbrage at the term eco-terrorism. He regarded the United States government and corporate ravaging and raping and pillaging of the habitat is the true eco-terrorism. He regarded sabotage as a tool for stopping in its tracks the whole notion of terrorism. And he also realized that when that had to happen, probably it would invoke a police state. Well, as Doug said a few minutes ago, we're closing in on that sort of a situation right now. One of the things that really impresses me is when Ed was born on January 27th, 19, I mean, 29th, 1927, the human population had yet to reach 2 billion. And now 92, nearly 93 years later, 94 years later, we're approaching 8 billion. In other words, a 400% increase in human population. So this is another huge factor that has to be considered. There are just so many things that have to be seen within the bigger picture. And one of the things that Ed was, was a systems thinker, something that I admire enormously. He was not the reductionist thinker that so many people are brought to us by our educational system, but he saw things in juxtaposition. And that to me was fantastic. And he's bequeathed this whole legacy. Well, he, all of his books, I've got all of them here on the shelf. A lot of them, boy, they're just great books. And I just reread one of my favorite of his novels, which is not very well known, which is Good News, for which he received a Guggenheim. And it takes, it's a, his futuristic Western. It takes place in a, a post-atomic bomb future. And it's an amazing novel. And a lot of prescience is contained in that. But he has inspired so many of us. I know that there are those of us who still regard him as our best friend. And that's what I have to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Jack.
And ML, did you have one more piece that you wanted to say on this thread? Just go ahead and take yourself off of mute. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, add that Ed would be, you know, thrilled more than thrilled to see the protests that are happening today, and amongst all the young people also, um, who are speaking out against climate, you know, speaking for uh, social justice and against, you know, the, the the climate the way it is and. I think that when Greta said, you lied to us, you gave us false hope. You told us that the future was something to look forward to. We children are doing this because we want our hopes and dreams back. And I just think Ed would look at all these young people today, plus the other protests and say, yeah, it is about time that we do this right now. Thank you. We've been, been talking a lot about the the different tools that that you all have picked up and the different methods to you know to be activists and to be active and engaged in the world and Kasha I wanted to come back to you for just you know a little bit of a different spin on that I think you have been thinking about the the question of silence and how that came up in Terry's work yeah thank you um, so Terry and wrench from wrench from the land you and ML speak about silence and how it can be a source of nourishment for grounding oneself finding inspiration and planning future action, which I find really powerful. Um, in your words, silence helps us realize both what we love and what we are losing. Um, and yet silence can also be a lot of other things as well. So for example, in other contexts, silence can be a sign of privilege where maybe people have a responsibility to speak up but are choosing that, it, that it's easier to remain silent. So I'm wondering as an activist um, and everybody on this call who sees themselves as activists, I suppose, how do you know when to find silence and practice reflection versus knowing when it's time to speak up and act? Thank you for that question, Kashi, Kasha. Um, I think it's really important to look at whose voices are being silenced in the environmental movement traditionally. Um, because it has been a white movement and it has been early on largely a male movement. And I think one of the aspects of activism today that I think is so powerful is that we are seeing activists um, from native communities. We're seeing black activists, brown activists, women, um, a much more diverse view of what envir environmentalism means. Also not just a single issue like wilderness, which when I was in college, it was a single issue for me until half my family died from cancer. And I realized the health of the planet is our own health. But I think one of the things that's been so powerful in the state of Utah, which as you know, is extremely conservative, has been seeing the leadership of the tribes of native nations coming forward with um, their voices on Bears Ears National Monument, that you have the Hopi, the Dene, Navajo, Zuni, Ute Mountain Ute, Ure Ute, um, that we saw what Jack's been involved with, with Black Mesa, with the Hopi and Navajo. Um, we see Standing Rock, we see Sunrise Movement, we see um, Extinction Rebellion, we see Riders Rebel, and, and so many people on the street, um, diverse, fighting, speaking, acting on behalf of justice, both social justice, racial justice, and environmental justice. I think what we're seeing is that all of these are coming together in justice for all. And climate, I think, is, is also um, leading this forward. Not that people of privilege won't feel it less, but in the end, um, I keep thinking that that it will be climate that can create this global movement where all voices not only will be heard, but must be heard. So I'm interested, I know what silence is for me, coming out of a Mormon culture. Um, women were not given voice. They still don't have the priesthood. And I think that has been my act of resistance to speak. Um, and I think, it's powerful to see that young people and people from all different 
um, backgrounds, race, class, um, and geographies are, are now speaking up, realizing that these are not just social issues or environmental issues, but ultimately spiritual issues. Thanks, Terry. Before we, we have some good audience questions that are really following along this theme, and I, I think we'll turn to that in, in just a moment. Um, you mentioned Bears Ears and the Native Coalition that have helped to make that happen. And John, I wanted to invite you to, I think you have a question for Jack about um, his work with Indigenous communities. Sure, yeah, Jack. Um, so throughout your career, you've demonstrated a strong commitment to working with Indigenous activists, communities, and nations. Um, so just in short, uh, what ways has this work shaped your views about environment, politics, and activism? Um, and can you share some examples or some relationships that have changed the way you approach environmental activism based on your work with um, Indigenous folks? Yes, thanks for that question, John, because that's really been a huge part of my life. Uh, I've been involved in environmental stuff starting way back when, even in the 1950s, but in 1970, a good pal of mine who had been the Southwestern historian for the National Park Service, a man named Bill Brown, shared with me some scuttlebutt about the imminent mining that was to take place on Black Mesa, which is a landform that is sacred to both traditional Hopi and Navajo people. And I had many friends, I, I should mention the preface this is that in 1964, I was privileged to live in a fork stick Hogan adopted into a Navajo family up at Navajo Mountain where I lived for many months. And it was there that I realized, it was like an epiphany for me. I realized the extent to which habitat helps shape perspective of an indigenous culture that just came through big time. So at any rate, after, and I had many friends among the Navajos and the Hopis by 1970. So when I had this uh, vision of what was about to happen on Black Mesa brought to me by Bill Brown, I went out to Black Mesa and I contacted an old Hopi friend of mine, a man named David Minonia, Nalao long gone. He was actually born in 1873. But the upshot is I told David about this and he asked me to stay. I camped outside his place in uh, Hope Villa for a night or two. And then the following day, we went into a, uh, a, a place on somebody's place over in uh, Second Mesa. 63 Hopi elders were there together. And I told them what I had heard, which is that Black Mesa was to be strip mined for coal by the Peabody Coal Company in order to supply coal first for a uh, heretofore not, uh, is yet to be constructed mine up on the banks of Lake Powell, the Navajo generating station. The coal was to be transported from Black Mesa over the Kaibato Plateau, which is one of the most beautiful landscapes I know, over to this mine at the rate of a whole truckload of coal a day, 2,500 megawatts a day worth of coal. Also another mine was to be the recipient of coal slurried through a pipeline from Black Mesa over to near Bullhead City, Nevada. And water was to be pumped out of the Black Mesa aquifer at the rate of 2000 gallons a minute. Just imagine that. Here we are in the heart of the Colorado Plateau, itself one of the most arid regions in North America. And boy, when the Hopi people, these 63 Hopi people heard about this, they really got mad, really mad. And they wanted to take down the uh, tribal council that had signed a treaty with Department of the Interior and contracts with the Peabody Coal Company to do this. After they called to calm down and discuss this for a while, they asked me if I would try to help them stop it. Well, that started the Black Mesa Defense Fund. Started the Black Mesa Defense Fund 10 days before the first Earth Day in 1970. And 
with the help of, well, it was, there were several of us who were involved in all of that. Jimmy Hopper, Terry Moore, a whole bunch of people who I won't name right this minute, but we gave it our best shot for years to try to thwart this whole thing. But we had taken on the Central Arizona Project, which I regard to be perhaps the greatest environmental debacle ever visited upon the North American Southwest, that and the Glen Canyon Dam. One of the things that interests me is this novel, The Monkey Wrench Gang. Part of that was to try to stop what was going to provide fuel for the Central Arizona Project. And one of the things I never did ask Ed is why did he never mention <laughs> the Central Arizona Project in that novel? Well, the upshot is, is that having worked with those Native Americans, I mean, in 1972, a group of those people, we were able to get enough funding together from different sources, including a wonderful concert performed by Don McLean. We got the funding together for Hopis, a couple of members of the Black Mesa Defense Fund, and some Navajos to go to the first UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm, Sweden. And while very little happened on a geopolitical level, what that turned into, we rented an art gallery over there that became third world central for other indigenous peoples who were being faced with the same situation of Western culture going in, pillaging the landscape, and by the same token, destroying the cultural perspectives of the people who lived there. So for the many years now, for the last, well, for the last 50 years, I spent a huge amount of my time wandering through every indigenous culture I can find. And there are people there from Nez Perce people up in the Clearwater watershed all the way down into Chiapas near the, uh, well, different watersheds throughout the entire West and Mexico. And I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds of Native American peoples and other indigenous peoples like the Hispano people of the Rio Grande Valley where I live. And one of the things that I've discovered is that people who still practice their indigenous traditional cultural practices all regard the landscape as sacred. Whereas so much of Western culture has secularized habitat to turn it into money. I have many dear, dear friends. One of my great friends in this lifetime was a wonderful woman who passed away about five years ago. Her name was Rina Swensel. She was from the Santa Clara Tewa language Pueblo, which is on the Western bank of the Rio Grande. And, and she had so much to say to me about Tewa perspective. And I spent so many time, so much time in different of the uh, Pueblos. And I've come to regard those Pueblos, those Puebloan Indians. They inhabit what I think of as the Pueblos as gardens of consciousness because they are so conscious of what their habitat has to teach them. And working with Sari Indians and Huichol Indians, Tarahumaras, Yaquis, I have a very dear old friend who's a Tahono O'odham lore master who lives not far north of the border between Mexico and the United States in the Sonoran Desert. And he said to me one day, one of the most profound things anybody's ever said to me, he said, if you look at nature and cannot see yourself in it, then you're too far away. And that resides in the frontal lobes of my consciousness on a daily, hourly by hourly basis. The, into, the indigenous peoples of the North American continent, many of whom have been extirpated, have been absolutely vital in my own understanding of the relationship of culture to habitat. And thus I've tried to use many of those excerpts from those interviews for my radio series and my books. Thanks, Jack. You know, we have our, uh, with our, our, our last few minutes, we have about 10 minutes left. I wanna you know, continue on, I think one of the questions that this conversation about um, what some of you all have learned in your work with indigenous communities, um, 
and what Terry had mentioned about uh, what had been a limited role for women in the environmental movement um, brings up some really interesting questions about privilege and access. And Kristen from our, our audience, she asked a question about how do we overcome what has traditionally been a lack of racial diversity and inclusion in the American environmentalist movement? And she flags this, this question of direct action. She says, one of the many privileges of being white seems to be the ability to engage in civil disobedience and protest without fearing for your livelihood or even your life. Um, and I know all of you uh, have chosen civil disobedience at some times um, as a tactic. I was curious if you, in our last few minutes here, if you all have thoughts about you know, sort of that role of privilege and inclusion in the environmental movement, and perhaps are there constructive ways to exploit your own privileges in order to allow more people into the movement? Doug, do you want to say something? You know, should. one of the things that I've seen that it's been very moving is you know, when you look at the history of the Freedom Riders to see that it was both black and white people that, that did that together. And I think to for white people of privilege, such as myself, you know, to think what does it mean to be a good ally? You know, also as an older person, you know. Um, and I think the intergenerational, interracial, all of these conversations have to be had. And I think that um, the most powerful actions are ones where these tactics, these strategies are brought forward um, in the hard conversations. You know, what is the goal? Who needs to be protected? Who can um, go forward with less risk? Or what is the aim? So I think these are complicated issues and I don't have one answer. I just know that for me in Utah with Bears Ears, working with elders like Jonah Yellowman and Evangi Gray and Willie Gray Eyes as examples, um, I think it's really important to listen and to ask the question, you know, what do you need? How can I support you? And to go from there and each, each action, each reaction um, is specific to time and place and community. Yeah. I'd like One to add the, something uh, to that. Uh, I could too. Go ahead, why don't, don't, you, guys, why don't you go and then we'll pass it over to Jack. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I learned, I learned how powerful, rich, and treacherous and murder, murderous the opposition was. When I was 20 years old, I invited uh, Martin Luther King to come and speak at the University of Michigan. And, you know, I raised money to do it and picked him up at the airport and all that. I got such incredible uh, resistance and exposure to hate literature and the John Birch Society from especially the Dean of the Engineering College then. And, uh, you know, I, 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 knew, I knew they'd stop at nothing. And a few years later, after my return from Vietnam as a Green Beret medic, it bothered the few friends were around me because I wasn't surprised enough when they killed Martin Luther King. You know, I knew he had enemies and I was surprised that it took that long to get to him. And uh, it, it forever shut me of a whole bunch of, uh, an, old, an old batch of, of, of friends. You know, I was somehow outside that. That's what I expected of the world. And it's still possible today. Don't underestimate these sons of bitches. That's all, Jack.
Yeah, if you're still on mute, if you can unmute yourself and then we can hear yeah, you. I was trying to say on what Doug was saying about the power. I think it's really important that environmental groups and NGOs um, find courage to support those who are willing to be arrested. Um, and I think because of fundraising, um, a lot of the big green groups have been very cowardly. And, and so I think that um, direct action, civil disobedience should be brought into the major environmental groups, um, that they can be more supportive, braver um, on the front lines. Many are, and I think that's why I have so much respect for Extinction Rebellion and the Sunrise Movement um, as two examples. But I think we need to put pressure on those organizations with real power, like NRDC, the Sierra Club, I think has been very powerful in acknowledging the power and role of civil disobedience. But I think we need um, to see more support from those that have the kind of power membership and money behind them. Well, I, where I live in New Mexico, it's a very, it's sort of a multicultural proving ground. There are many different Native American peoples represented here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the Puebloan Indians live here. And uh, Navajos live here, Apaches live here, and the Hispanos live here. And there has been a real meld of that kind of consciousness. And back in the 1960s, early 60s, the counterculture movement happened here big time too. And one of the things that has struck me about that movement is that it has been hearkening back to the original concept asked of me. It goes back very much to an anarchistic perspective, but it also gets into a level of egalitarianism, activism. And boy, the Native American people invited many of us into their homes and into their kivas and into their teepees to let us know where they were coming from. And so to me, the whole sense is to pursue this reciprocally, work with people who want to be worked with. I so laud the Indians who stood up for their rights, you know, over the, 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 the tar sands pipeline. Boy, that was a real moment of truth. And my heart was with those people right down the line but we have to remain as active as we can be. Like I'll be 85 on my next birthday and I can't run as fast as I used to. And so I have to be very careful on that level of activism because I don't like going to jail. Never did, never will. I think we have to be as intelligent and intuitive as we can be. And we can take a great hue from all cue from all of these people who have these different perspectives. For me, it ranged all the way back into the 1950s when I played jazz for a living and I was frequently the only non-black person on the stand. And when those black musicians welcomed me into their group, man, what a feeling that was. And so I understand what that feels like to be the only white guy on the stand. It's an amazing feeling. And that has stayed with me for the rest of my life. Thanks, Jack. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to, um, to Dave Foreman, who certainly in his lifetime has seen plenty of risks. And uh, I have appreciated what he has done, including Ken Slight. Thanks, ML. And I think that means you have the, the last word. We've had a really full 90 minute conversation here. Um, and I can't say thank you enough to uh, everyone for making this possible, you know, to our panelists for putting together these super thoughtful and engaging questions for our guests and showing up fully and giving us a glimpse into your minds and your lives and your experience and I would just say as we're, there's, there's no way to, to summarize or, or come away from this conversation with a nugget. Um, but I will say that, you know, I think that what ML has opened up here with this collection of interviews and the film that she's put together 
is just a treasure trove of glimpses into the myriad of different ways that people can approach activism and environmental thought um, and tactics and the big picture strategy as well. Um, and each one of our guests, Jack and Doug and Terry, uh, so much of their work is available to us in the bookstore and online and in our libraries. And I would really encourage our audience members, uh, as I'm going to do, you know, to dive into their work and to see what all can be learned there. Um, and to check out the film wrenched as well. Some of the archival footage that ML brought in there is just priceless. Um, and this this question about direct action we've come back to at the end, there's some terrific footage of guerrilla theater and, and actions that took place um, within, within that film as well. So again, the, the book that we've been inspired by today is Wrenched from the Land, Activists Inspired by Edward Abbey, um, edited by ML Lincoln and Diane Rappaport. That's available from University of New Mexico Press. Uh, as I also mentioned, Wrench is avail Wrenched is available for streaming online. Um, and just a big thank you to Che and the University of Wisconsin for, for hosting us. Um, and again, just a deep bow of gratitude to all of our guests and panelists for taking so much time to be with us so fully today. So thanks everybody. <laughs>